Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome founder of Content Marketing Institute, Joe Polizzi. Red light, green light. Red light, green light. Red light, green light. Red light, green light. Red light, All right. How we doing, New York? How we doing, New York? All right. Okay. All right. Everybody stand up real quick and then sit back down. Let's get the blood moving. There we go. Don't leave. <laughs> All right, thank you very much. You've been sitting for a while. I've got you for the next two hours and 30 minutes, so I'm gonna, I wanna make sure that, now I'm gonna briefly talk for about 35 minutes or so about a business model that fits really well into Seth's customer first thinking. Now, I've been speaking I guess professionally for the last 10 or 11 years, and I've learned that there is one key to a successful keynote presentation. I don't know if any of you know this, but the key is to set extremely low expectations for the presentation. So I'm gonna set your expectations for you, and I want you to get one thing out of this presentation, specifically with what Seth was talking about this morning. There's a takeaway slide at the end of this presentation that there's 10 takeaways. I don't expect you to take away 10 things. I expect you to look for that one thing. So throughout this presentation, look for that one thing that you can take, integrate into your business right away. We've got a lot to do. Anybody ever heard of a little film called Star Wars? Yes. <laughs> yes. So I don't know if you know the backstory here, but in uh, 1976, the Fox executives did not think very highly of Star Wars, and they thought it was going to be a big failure, a big flop. And at the same time, they owed this gentleman $1 million before he finished Star Wars. And they're thinking, what are we going to do? This is going to be a flop. We owe George Lucas a $1 million. What are we going to do? So George Lucas, being Mr. George Lucas, went and did a little bit of negotiating and said, OK, I'll forego the $1 million if you give me full merchandising rights to Star Wars. Ah, right? Smart man. Now, the Fox executives, they said, this is great. This is going to be fantastic because this, this is not going to sell anything. So we just saved ourselves a million dollars. And the Fox executives knew what, there's only one way to make money off of movies, right? And that's to sell more tickets. That's the business model. That was the business model of movie making. So he said, oh my gosh, this is fantastic. George, you take those merchandising rights. They're not worth anything. And we just want the ticket sales for whatever they're going to be. But we want to save ourselves a million dollars. So from 1977 to 2015, including all the Star Wars movies in that time period, ticket sales were about $5 billion. Not bad. Not bad. So the Fox executives turned out to be wrong. At the same time, <laughs> merchandising revenue was 12 billion billion with a B, dollars. So George knew at the time that the business model of movie making was changing. And that's what I want you to think as we talk about this presentation this morning that, and I know you all have things to sell. You know, Seth talked this morning about the R, you know, ROI, making revenue. But I think your prospects for making revenue in different ways has never been greater than it is today. But I don't think we think about it. So I want you to put this kind of model into your marketing process. Let's take a, a quick look at Disney. Now this, I don't know if you can see all of this, but this is a visual business model for Disney done in 1957 by Mr. Walt Disney himself. This is actually a picture taken in my living room. That's <laughs> how geeky I am. I've got Disney's business model in my living room. I won't let my wife take it down. <laughs> if you look at this and how this is set up, you know, because we think Disney's model is new because they're a media company and a marketing, a product and service company, but they're both and they were built as both. How do we build an audience? We build an audience by these amazing films. How do we generate the most, most of our revenue? At that time, they generated most of their profit through Disneyland. But every one of these things that you see up here from the TV to the merchandising to the comic books to the music all made money. So if you could do it, which I believe you can, everything that you're doing in marketing can actually make direct and indirect revenue. But most of us don't think of it that way. So in my latest book, I talk all about this, Robert Rose and I. And I really believe if you want it, this business model is here for you. 
to think that every piece of marketing you do that you can generate direct and indirect revenue off it. But the first thing you have to do is build a loyal audience. And I know you want conversions, you're optimizing for that, you want leads, great. Call them whatever you want. I call it building an audience, right? It's all about them, it's not about you. And Seth talked about this morning, if you start with what do we have to sell, you're already gonna be in trouble. So let's focus on building that loyal audience first. So today's agenda that I'm gonna finish for you in 24 minutes and 59 seconds is Build an audience first. If you build an audience first, you can do pretty much anything with your business model. It's a very strategic approach. And then you can monetize it. And you may choose, you may say, this, you may say Joe, this is too hard. I don't wanna do this, that's fine. But as, as long as you're all creating content anyways, which you are, you might as well create content that people want and do it strategically and create a business model like your industry's never seen before. So I think the potential is there. So the first thing I'm gonna do is I'm gonna go through the step of, steps of building an audience that knows, likes, and trusts you better than anyone else in your industry, and then we're gonna talk about how to monetize it. So quickly, the first one, finding your sweet spot. Now most of you have this. You probably haven't done it as an exercise, but you have this, it exists. So on the one side, what's your customer's pain points, right? What are their problems? What's keeping them up at night? And on the other side, where do you have a knowledge or skill that's unique, that's different, that stands above the rest in your industry? So that's what we call the sweet spot. The intersection of that is your sweet spot. Give you a quick example. John Deere created the Furrow Magazine in 1897. Still going on today in digital and print format. If you said, Joe, who's the largest media company in the farming and agricultural industry? I would say it's not a media company. It's John Deere. 1.5 million subscribers, 40 countries, 14 different languages. I don't know if you knew that. One of my favorite case studies on the planet. They started with their sweet spot. What is it? Well, on the one side, they're targeting farmers. So what are the operational challenges on a farm? You know, how do I plan at the right times? What technology do I need to use? And on the other side, from a technology standpoint, maybe no one better in the world on agricultural and technology than John Deere. So very, very simple. Now, if all the other stuff I talked about at the beginning five minutes bores you, this is what I need you to stay awake for. This is the most important. Because if you don't get step two, if you don't get the content tilt right, none of this stuff would work. And when we go into, at Content Marketing Institute, we work with mostly billion dollar companies, and we go in and do an audit, this is the part they're missing. All right. So I'm gonna start with an example. This is Mrs. Ann Reardon. She's known as the baking queen of Sydney, Australia. She was a stay-at-home mom, and she loved to cook. She was a food scientist. She really wanted to do something. She said, I'm going to start, like most of us would, hey, I'm going to start a video blog. Let's do something on YouTube. Started in January 2012. She hit 100 subscribers on YouTube, and she thought, I can't believe 100 people are actually watching my videos. This is unbelievable. And then, as you can see today, she has over 3 million subscribers to her video channel. Here it is, here's her content brand, how to cook that. There's where you see the 3.2 million subscribers. Now here's where I want you to think about this. We all stop at the sweet spot. We always say, okay, here's our customer's problems, and here's what we're really good at. Let's create a whole bunch of content in all different forms around that. But it's not enough. You have to actually have to tilt the content. You have to find an area of little to no competition on the web where you actually have a chance to break through and get that attention that Seth was talking about. So you have to tilt the content. So how did Ann Reardon do this with no budget? And I love this example because she had no money to do this. She said, how do I make a five to seven pound cake that looks and tastes like a Snickers bar? Anybody like the looks of that this morning? I'll jump on that, dig into it with a spoon. Now, she was a little upset that Instagram changed their logo when she created this one. But she said, how do we create a perfect replica of an Instagram logo and put it into a cake? This one went super, super viral. And she has more and more of these videos that she releases on a weekly basis, just like this. And you know, she's targeting an audience, just like a lot of people who were into food and recipes were targeting an audience, but her content tilt is what separated her. She said, how do we create impossible food creations? She wanted her audience to say, oh my God, how did she do that? How did she make that happen? And at the time when she launched this, 2011, 2012, not a lot of people were doing this. Actually, she was the only one. She was very unique. She was the first one out doing this kind of stuff. And that's why she's a multimillionaire today, traveling all over Asia Pacific, giving talks like these. Now, if you're like, well, I don't know where to start with this. 
The best place to start is what we call creating a content marketing mission statement. So I'm gonna go through that in a little bit of detail because it's really important because I grew up in publishing in media. The first thing you do when you're creating content is you say, stop, I need to actually create an editorial mission statement. Anyone who's a journalist, publishing side, you know this. You start with an editorial mission statement. When we go into billion dollar companies and start talking about content strategy, no one has an editorial mission statement. So I want you to start with that, and I know you're doing content already, but we need to go back and craft this, and you need to share this with your team. Now, anyone here from ExxonMobil? Raise your hand if I can. Okay, good, we're gonna talk about them. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's a, I know the folks, there. they're great, great marketing people. I feel bad for them, but they're great people. I wanna read this, because <laughs> it's important. ExxonMobil Corporation is committed to being the world's premier petroleum and petrochemical company. To that end, we must continuously achieve superior financial and operating results while simultaneously adhering to high ethical standards. I'm, I'm ready to, I, I, isn't that unbelievable? Aren't you excited? I'm like that, I just wanna run through a wall for ExxonMobil. <laughs> That's how exciting that is. Now, the reason why I'm showing you this is, how can you create a content strategy out of this? May, maybe for your investors, maybe, but it's very hard to create content that's going to excite people and build fans with this. And this is most companies, I'm just picking on Exxon, but this is how most companies are set up. Now we have to make sure we don't start like this with our content marketing strategy. Let me give you some examples of how to do it right. Indium Corporation, they manufacture industrial soldering equipment. So for all you B2B brands that think you have boring content, just look at this is the most boring content I could find on the web. <laughs> Nobody cares about this except their customers. They created a blog called Engineer to, From One Engineer to Another in 2006. From 18 months later, they increased their qualified leads by 600%. And this is how they go to market now. They pulled back all their trade show marketing and their advertising, and this is how they go to market. Because if you type anything on industrial soldering equipment on the web, they come up. They've done this really, really well. How do they start? With a mission statement. Very simple. Helping engineers answer the most challenging industrial soldering questions. Who are we talking to? One audience. Talking to engineers. We're not talking to plant managers. We're not talking to CFOs. Just engineers. What are we trying to do? Help them answer the most challenging industrial soldering questions. We're not talking about ball bearings. We're not talking about siding. We're just talking about this. They can be the leading experts in the world at this. So for you, what can you be the world's leading expert on? And if you say, I can't, too much competition, you're not niche enough. You've got to go deeper. So let's break it apart. There's actually three steps. This is my good friend, Darren Rouse. He created Digital Photography School. It's a multi-million dollar photography site. You go to his About Us page, his mission statement is right there. Welcome to DPS, a website with simple tips to help digital camera owners get the most out of their cameras. Core target audience. We're talking about to digital camera owners. What are we gonna deliver? Simple tips, probably bulleted list, numbered list of some kind. What is the outcome? The most important thing you can do in your mission statement is create the outcome, not you selling more widgets. What are you trying to do? How are you trying to help them? You could actually add that to your editorial content calendar for each piece of content you're trying to be optimized for, what's the outcome for the audience? In this case, helping them get the most out of their cameras. As you can see, not rocket science, just really, really easy stuff that none of us do. And everyone that's creating content for your team needs to know this, should have this with them. All right, by the way, not creating any content yet. Most companies we go into, they get an idea for content and um, we're creating, we're starting, we're getting the content producers in. No, you're not. We wanna build a strategy first. So now we're at stage three, which you can start to build the content. We call this building the base. And I love this chart. Because in 1990, anybody remember, you're so young. Before, do you remember before 1990, many of you? There were only eight ways that you could communicate with your audience. So it was really easy, that's why advertising was awesome. Well in 2018, there's hundreds if not thousands of different ways. And we as marketers thought, great, let's use them all. Let's create. Tweets and podcasts and blogs and webinars and everything, and let's do it all at the same time. Let's see if that works. What we found out in our research, we talked to over 100 different companies, did a lot of research on this. We found out is that those companies that did content marketing really, really well did this. They all did it the same thing. They didn't scatter their message all over everywhere. 
They said, no, we're going to do it this way. One content type. Is it audio, video, textual, plus image? One main platform. Is it my blog or website? Is it YouTube? Is it iTunes? Consistently delivered, which we all have a problem with. Anybody have an e-newsletter out here? You ever, do you have a regular schedule for it or what we think it is? Usually when we go in and we look, do a content audit with companies, they say, well, when do you send the e-newsletter out? We send it out every Friday. Well, when did it go out last week? Wednesday. <laughs> what? Are you, are you kidding me? Well, that, well, Bob was out on Friday, and he's in charge of the e-newsletter, so we had to wait. <laughs> it's always Bob's fault. Right? We have to be consistent. That's one of the cores. And then long period of time. If you said, Joe, I want to do this content marketing thing. I got six months. What can I do? I would say, nothing. Don't do it. You're trying to build an asset that's going to provide revenue for you for a long, long time. You have to commit to more than six months. The average time from start to monetization for this model is 15 months. The thing is, is when you hit 15 months, you're driving two, three, five, seven different types of revenue. And we'll get there in a second. So we call the base. Just a couple of examples. My good friend Brian Clark started Copy Blogger, many of you know it, back in 2006. Just started with a blog. So Texture Plus Image Content on his blog site, delivered five days a week, took him 18 months to monetization. Now he's one of the fastest growing software as a service companies out there. That's it, right? You all know. It's just doing the work, building the strategy and then doing the work. John Lee Dumas created Entrepreneur on Fire, great podcast. I was guest number 1154 on his podcast. This was a couple years ago. 1153 days before I went on the air, he delivered a podcast at 3.30 a.m. Eastern Time every day before that. Now, I'm not saying you have to do daily. God help us all if you do. But the point is, he's consistent. He, picked, he differentiated himself because no one was doing a daily podcast. He was, and now he is a multi, multi-millionaire. And if you want to see his revenues, go to his site, and he'll show you the breakdown of his revenues that he generates off of EOL. So one content type, one platform, consistently delivered over time. That's how we build a base. Now, once we build a base, now we can actually harvest the audience. Now you can build the audience. Any social media managers, directors out there? I know we got a lot of search couple. All right, I'm going to pick on social media for a little bit. Nothing against Facebook here, but I'm going to use Facebook as an example. So let's say you're the uh, social media director for IBM. Here's your Facebook page, and you want to do a post. You all know how this is, turns out to be a bad ending to the story because, because you have about a million people, according to when I took the screenshot, that like this page and you want to send out something and you say, hey, of those million, how many organically are going to see that? And you know what the answer is, right? Almost nobody. Less than 1%. Less than 1% of 1% now and probably in the next 18 months, zero. Nothing. Nothing you will send out as brands on Facebook will be seen organically, for the most part. That's what we're thinking it's going to go. So we put all our assets into building an audience for who? For Facebook. And good for them. <laughs> and how about Cisco? Let's say you're Cisco and you're on Google+. Folks, Google doesn't even know what they're doing with Google+. <laughs> Do you know? Because if you know, tell the product people at Google. I'm sorry, I love Google. I use it all the time. I have stock at Google, disclaimer, all good. So the point is I want you to focus on subscribers because I know you've got a lot of things to do in search, all very important. But in a lot of those cases, if you're thinking about the business model, you can lead that to building your audience, building a subscriber as your key metric. So this is my very sophisticated yay boo scale <laughs> for subscriber hierarchy. Not an exact science, just for visualization. And by the way, I know what you're thinking. Email, Joe? Are you kidding me? It's like you probably got up this morning, you had 50 to 70 emails that you're like, how did I? I didn't subscribe to all this stuff. It's all spam. How did I get this? The point is, is what we know about email and creating a subscriber process like that, if they actually sign up and you don't add them to your list, they actually sign up and request it and they go to, you go to your inbox, you have a couple things every day that you say, well, I'm not going to delete that. I want to open that. That's really important. That's what we have to do. Because email is still the one connection that we can have the most control over. Email, print, and all the way down. The other ones, you can mix and match. 
But the point is, we don't control all that stuff. Let's say you have, most of you have a YouTube page, right? You're building YouTube subscribers, which is fine until, let's say somebody comes to your page and they subscribe to your YouTube account. And you're like, great, because the next day they're going to go and they're going to see your stuff if they go on YouTube, right? No, not necessarily. Because if YouTube says, no, I want, I want to show Jimmy Kimmel or Ellen because I get more advertising revenue that way, that's what they're going to do instead of showing your stuff. And they have the prerogative to do that. So where can you get the most control as you do go this, uh, do this through? But, but let's say you don't believe me. Let's go and show you BuzzFeed. I know you're all very sophisticated, so you don't spend a lot of time on BuzzFeed. But <laughs> let me use this example. It's really important. So BuzzFeed. A couple years ago, their business model was really, really falling down. Why? Because most of their audience was on Facebook. And then what did Facebook do? They took away all their access to it. So they weren't letting their organic content through. And they were freaking out. The investors were like, this is crazy. This is not going to help us. What are we going to do? So they dedicated themselves. They said next year they're going to create a million subscribers. And they started to create all these e-newsletters specifically to their audience personas. So they said, OK, great. We're going to create BuzzFeed News and books. And you can get a dog a day. And then I don't know if you saw this one. Anybody subscribe to Do Today? Yeah, you can get like uh, every Monday morning, you get like Channing Tatum in your inbox or something like that. I'm not subscribed to it myself, but I hear it's fantastic. <laughs> the point is BuzzFeed did this program. They got over a million subscribers. Since then, millions and millions and millions more, they were able to, uh, to uh, change their business model and drive revenues in ways that you probably aren't aware of, and I'll show you that in a second. So to do this, you have to have two things, very simple. An amazing e-newsletter. How many of you have amazing e-newsletters? One. <laughs> One of you does. You all have to have amazing e-newsletters, and then you have to have something that people actually want to sign up for. So give them you know, an e-book, something, a value research tool, so they actually sign up for it. Then we diversify. So most of us start with diversification. We actually want to end with diversification. Now that you created your one type, one channel, Look at Sony. Sony was great. Alpha Universe program. They started with just textual plus image content. Then they went and started their podcast program. Then they went and they went to their in-store program, to independent stores and did workshops on site. Then they launched their online university. That's how you're supposed to do it. And that's how they've been able to dominate the industry. And their goal is to sell more camera equipment this way, and they've done a really good job. At Content Marketing Institute, we did the same thing. For the first 36 months, we were just a blog. And then when we launched Chief Content Officer Magazine and Content Marketing World and the podcast that sold marketing and on and on and on. So that's the way to do it. And now I've got seven minutes to talk to you about monetization. It's critical to that making this work is building that audience first, an audience that knows, likes, and trusts you. Then we can monetize it. There's 10 different ways that you can monetize this, five direct and five indirect. Most of you are just using probably Products or services, probably one. I believe you're selling yourself short. I want you to focus on, I think the future is going to be four, five, six different ways that you're going to be able to monetize through our media marketing model. Let me give you an example of this. Anybody familiar with Aero Electronics? A large electronics dis distribution company. They're 119 on the Fortune 500 list, $24 billion in revenue in 2016. Pretty big company. If you said, who is the largest media company in the electro B2B electronics industry, would you think that it is Aero Electronics? They own 51 media brands in the space through organic growth and purchase. So if you are in the electronics industry, you go through Aero Electronics. And by the way, they're growing in profit every year through selling more advertising, more paid subscriptions, and they create content services. They actually create content for their direct competitors, custom content. I'm not kidding you. I wouldn't do that myself, but they're actually selling this. So this is happening right now. And if a Fortune 119 company can do it, I think you can all do it. So I'm going to quickly give you an example of a few of these so you can start to think. Advertising uh, sponsorship is your lowest hanging fruit. I don't think we think of it enough that you can get your part, just like um, C3 Conductor has done here with their partners out there that are helping support this very important event. So when we launched CMI, the first thing was, hey, let's get our partners involved. Let's put some, you know, very simple banners and buttons. Uh, we've got sponsors at the bottom of every one of our page that we call benefactors. We have sponsored webinars 
And we actually have a print magazine that we sell sponsorship into as well. We make money off of every one of these. So I think we fail to think a lot of times when we do these, when you do a custom magazine, when you do your, your website, you think, oh, I can't do that because I'm taking away. Well, I don't think of it that way. I think if you can have some partners that make sense as the buyer's journey moves along, you can generate rev direct revenue and profit off of each one of these as well. Conferences and events. We're, we're in one right now. Conductor's done a very good job with C3, if you think about it. We did that uh, our, by far. 70% of our total revenue comes from Content Marketing World over at CMI. That's our most important thing. Seth mentioned a little company called Salesforce. Dreamforce, one of the most valuable events in the world, especially technology events. I think if they sold, if you just said, hey, let's just sell Dreamforce, they'd probably get a billion dollars for it. That doesn't, has nothing to do with what they're selling as, as sales uh, software as well. Subscriptions. Anybody know? A company called Zappos, bought by Amazon. I love this example. So if many of you know Tony Shea, the CEO. He wrote a book about culture and changing culture and started to get a lot of big Fortune 500 companies coming to Zappos saying, hey, can you teach us about culture? Um, you know, we have some culture issues. What's your process? What did you use at Zappos? And he got so many people, so many fans built up. He said, well, maybe we can create something. They created Zappos Insights an independent business unit that's profitable, that they charge Fortune 500, Fortune 1000 companies monthly uh, fees for their ongoing guidance to help them with their culture. Isn't that something? If you knew that, I just think it's fantastic. Premium content, let's go to Digital Photography School. How does Digital Photography School make millions of dollars off of their website every year? They just sell eBooks from $5 to $50 on photography. Very, very simple. This content's so good that people will Pay for it. Back to BuzzFeed. Anybody, you know, if you see tasty branded videos, I'm sure if you're on Facebook and, and going through all that stuff, well, they said, well, how do we monetize the billions of dollars of views that we're getting from those videos outside of advertising and sponsorship? They said, well, maybe people will actually buy a print cookbook from their favorite tasty rep recipes. Anybody buy this? I don't know if anybody did. They sell these print-on-demand cookbooks that you can select. It costs you about $40 to $50 per. They launched it last year. In the first month, they sold over 100,000. 100,000 times average yield, $45 equals, you can do the math, a lot of revenue <laughs> that they've done very well. I've got another example in a second for them. Cleveland Clinic, I don't know if you know that, they actually create content for Google. Google says, hey, we need help in these search engine keywords. Can you go ahead and create content? And Cleveland Clinic does that. So when you become the expert in your category, all kinds of revenue opportunities open up. OK, so those are direct revenue. Those are some indirect revenue. We talk, you, and this is where you, you're already doing this. So Copyblogger does that. They have subscribers. So 99% of their revenue comes from email subscribers first. Back to BuzzFeed. So did you know you can walk through like Target and Kohl's and find a BuzzFeed smart cooker? Anybody? <laughs> I swear, I love the folks at BuzzFeed. And they're actually doing this, and they're going very pretty well. I talked to the folks at Kohl's, and they said they can't keep them on the shelves. Must be that BuzzFeed brand. It's fantastic. Services. Matthew Patrick launched a YouTube channel called Game Theory. My, uh, I've got two boys, two teenage boys, and they love Matt Pat. And he became so popular and, and understood the YouTube algorithm better than anyone else, he created a services consulting company around how to get found in YouTube and now is the biggest consultant to YouTube <laughs> itself. So he's created a multi-million dollar operation. So you think, oh, is he making a lot of money off of YouTube? Yeah, he's making some off of advertising. Where does he make much, most of his revenue? He created the services division. Recurring customers. Why does John Deere create the Furrow Magazine. Why did they create it in 1897? To have people that bought a John Deere buy another John Deere. So loyalty recurring, one of the best loyalty initiatives the world has ever seen. And then what about yield increase? I say I want to create better customers. Think Money, Mag Think Money from uh, Thinkorswim and Ameritrade. They created this magazine about five years ago. It was tough to keep it going because they couldn't make the case for, oh, we want to be a digital company and we want to launch a print magazine. It didn't work. The content champion was having a lot of issues with it. 
They said, okay, we were going to be able to make it. Give us some time. It took them two years to get the data. They found out that subscribers to this magazine end up trading five times more than those that don't subscribe. One of the best ROIs you can get. And fits right in really well as I wrap this up with what Seth was saying. We have to create value. And I know it's tough to do. I've been in your position. It's like we've got all this... Uh, We've got all these uh, KPIs we have to hit. We've got, we've got to sell these products. We've got to get more traffic. We've got to do all these things. The issue is, is that if we're not creating value for the audience, none of this is going to work. Then once we create that relationship, then we can extract that value and sell. Okay, here's your takeaway slide I promised you. So find a niche where you can literally be the leading expert in the world. Then you can develop your content marketing mission statement. When you start or go back, if you're, if you're having trouble, go back and say, well, maybe we should focus on one content type, one platform, and then deliver consistently like every media company has done since the dawn of time. Be careful about building your house on rented land. I'm not saying don't use social media. I'm saying be careful. It's not yours. It could be gone tomorrow. So build an, an audience of opt-in subscribers as part of what you're doing in search. You need an amazing e-newsletter, a remarkable download to do it. Then we diversify. And what we really want to figure out is what are our subscribers doing differently? How is that benefiting the business? That's, if you can answer that question, you will have a job for a long, long time. And then we can diversify your revenue streams. All right, did everyone get at least one thing? Everyone get more than one thing? <laughs> Wonderful. Thank you very much. Thanks for having me. Appreciate it.